appreciate it so much. And let's get things going. Those of you who have been here for a while know how I always start these things. I first like to go into your technology overview and remind you that in your lab manual, around page 56, we know it can alter by a page or two depending on what version you have, you'll find a list of a lot of formulas. And I've been advocating rather strongly for the use of only three of them. And that is binome.dis.range, norm.dis, which we're going to use today, and norm.inverse, which we're going to use today. All this other stuff, I'm going to remind you, that is a waste of your time. They work, they do the job just as fine, but they're honestly already covered by those other three formulas. And so if you want to learn additional formulas, you're welcome to. I'm not going to waste our time on them because everything we need can be done by just these three formulas. And so that's the good news. In terms of Excel formulas, there's only three additional formulas you need to know. Obviously, we've learned in the other units that there are additional kind of like algebraic formulas, you know, like NP and NPQ and all that stuff that we'll have to know and for, for the test. But in terms of Excel, there's only three brand new formulas, binom.dis.range, norm.dis, and norm.inverse. And we're going to learn, we're actually going to use them all today, but we're going to learn about them in the context of CLT. So I'm going to go ahead and give away the goose right away. When we're doing a CLT question, the only thing that's going to change about the problem is we're going to swap out standard deviation to something called standard error. Outside of that one little change, nothing else about what we've been doing is going to be any different. That's the good news. So just to be clear, normally when we're doing a normal distribution problem, we would do something like norm.dis. We would do some observation, some average, standard deviation, and then always, always true. The only thing that's going to change is this spot right here. We don't use standard deviation when it's CLT. Instead, we're going to put in there standard error, this SE. And the standard error calculation, the good news is, is just your standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, aka the fixed trial, how many people or things are involved in the study. Outside of that one modification, nothing else is going to be any different. And so for norm inverse, it's still going to be some probability, then the average. But now when we get to the step where we normally put the deviation, we're going to put standard error and then true. Actually, we don't do true for norm inverse, my bad. Just those three components. So it's still the same general process, the same general scope. We're just going to swap out the standard deviation with standard error. And we're going to see some examples so that we can learn how to identify a CLT question from all the other ones. But before we go that far, I want to finish my little chart I started to make last week and just remind people of how all this all, st all this stuff fits together. So we learned way back in test one is that numbers in general, data, because numbers in usually, right, our numbers in general, though, fall into two categories. Either they're discrete or they're continuous. And depending on what category the number is, we have a different approach for that. If it's a discrete case, we had our empirical and classical approach, which is simply the idea of taking some amount that you want divided by the total, right? The fraction thing. We also had our discrete distribution tables. And then lastly, we had the binomial, the special case of discrete. So our binome dot distribution techniques. And then last week, we started talking about continuous situations, like when you're measuring things like weight or height or, or length. And we talked about essentially from a normal distribution perspective. Well, so there's sometimes a case where it doesn't quite fit this situation, but we still want to do measurements on it. In that case, we call the central limit theorem. So essentially, when do we do CLT versus norm distribution if it's, if it's the same general functions? Well, there has to be essentially three things that have to happen. 
First, of course, we know it has to be continuous. Then the second thing, I'll put a little two here because this is the first thing that we want to worry about. The second thing is that we have to be dealing with a sample. And specifically, a sample that's greater than one. So we need at least a sample of two or more. Because CLT wants to study that sample, while the normal distribution techniques that we did last week were all talking about the population itself. So now we're going to learn how to calculate based, based off, of, off of sample. And then if we know we have a continuous data set that involves a sample, it has to meet one of two conditions. And so there's two conditions, which is the third idea. It has to be one of these has to be true, not both, just one of them. The first one is that we would need a sample size at least 30, so 30 or bigger. If it's 30 or bigger and it's a sample and it's continuous data, then we can do CLT. The other possibility, so I'm going to call it B here, so we have A or B. Don't know why I put it equals there. Let's just move that equals out of the way. There we go. The other possibility is that we could deal with a small sample if the population is normal. And we're going to see us do all this stuff. I'm just giving you the background of what's happening here. But if the population is normal, even if we don't have a big sample size, we can still apply CLT techniques because CLT uses the norm distribution techniques. And so if, if we're dealing with continuous data and the sample size greater than one, and one of these conditions are met, we will utilize CLT. And we'll learn today exactly what I mean when I say we will use CLT. But as we mentioned before, both of these use the same general Excel commands. We're still going to use norm.dis for any probability, and we're going to use norm.inverse for any kind of measurement. And so if you got an understanding of what you're doing with the regular normal distributions, then CLT is very easy because it's the same thing. It's just that one minor change of getting rid of the standard deviation and plugging in standard error. Otherwise, nothing is different at all. Okay, so before we jump into some problems, I really want to show you why CLT works and the big idea behind it. So we're going to go to the next tab called the General Intro to CLT. And what I want to do is roll 30 dice, or die, I guess, to be more clear. We're going to roll a die 30 times, and we're just going to measure those values. And before we do that, let's look at some preemptive stuff I put over here. The first thing you can see is I made a discrete distribution table, which I can because the dice are single values, right? We have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Those are the numbers that you can get when you roll the die. And since it's a classical probability, they all have the same output. They all can be one out of six chance. And so I just did a standard mean calculation, the standard um, average of that distribution. And you know, you just do X times P of X. You just multiply, 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 add them all up, and you get 3.5. So that means if I roll the dice on average, I get between a three or a four. If I keep averaging my rolls over and over again, that's the expected value, in other words. So now what I want to do is something similar by experiment, and we're just going to set this up by creating random data. I don't want to have any control, so you can't accuse me of cheating. I'm going to randomize rolls from one to six. And so that's my first roll of the die, but let's just take it all the way across so Excel can quickly generate 30 rolls for me. And you don't need to do this that part at home, you can just watch. And so I just simulated 30 very fast rolls. And what I want to do is take the average of those rolls. And so the average, I can't spell average. There we go. Average of this data set. And you can see that that particular rolls, when I rolled all 30 times, the average of that one case was 3.1. And so let's see what happens if I take this data set and I repeatedly roll this dice over and over again. Maybe I just do it about 10 times. And you see we get this kind of histogram where it's kind of like, you know, three molds, right? Three peaks going on here, but nothing special kind of popping up. Now let's get to that magic number in CLT world of 30. Let's go all the way down to 30 rolls. So right about here. And look at my distribution. It's starting to look normal. It's starting to go up and back down, which is why we got that magic threshold of 30, because 30 is when it starts to make that shape. And watch what happens if I go way past 30. 
I'm just going to grab this corner and take it way, 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 way down. Now, if I go back to my data, look at my data now. So in fact, as you get closer and closer to infinity, as you get really large numbers, the law of large numbers, this discrete data, when you look at their averages of all those rows, get more and more normal. And that's the property behind CLT, that the averages of the average, if I took all of these averages, did not mean to close that, if I took all of these averages and made a histogram about it, that distribution will get really close to be normal. Now, of course, you're going to only be approximately normal. You can see that this is kind of higher over here than it is over there, but we still got a peak in the middle and two edges. And so the data becomes closer and closer to normal as you get more and more of those events. And that's the kind of underlining principle of CLT. And even better, if I look at the average of the averages, if I take and find the average of that average column, the other thing you'll notice is this score pretty much matches the expected value score, the discrete distribution mean. And that's because the average of the averages will eventually start by law of large numbers approximating that value. And so it'll get closer and closer to that score. And so that's why under CLT, we assume something really important. Under CLT, we always, always, that's really important, always assume that the population mean is our sample mean, our sampling of our averages distributions mean, average distribution mean. And so in other words, this number here, we know if we increased it by more and more and more samples, it will get closer and closer to that 3.5 score. And so the center of our mean of our averages, our average of our averages, we're always going to assume is just the population mean that we know. That's the big idea there. So when we go and do norm.dis in our calculations, and we do our input, and then we have to do the mean, we're always going to use the population mean that we're given. We're not going to worry about any kind of sample mean that we calculate for that place there. Because by CLT, we know that the population mean is what the data is going to get closer and closer to as you get more and more samples. But this is the fundamental idea of CLT. You can take very discrete situations like this. This is very much discrete. And we can convert it into continuous data by making them all a bunch of averages. Averages are continuous data because we have decimal values. And if we look at the averages as data points, their values generally follow the normal distribution if the population so sample size is greater or equal to 30, or if it comes from a population that we know to be normal. In either of those two cases, cases we can do CLT. So that's the underlining principle of what CLT is. Let's actually look at some examples and do quote unquote CLT. Give you a second to look at these two. One of these, either the one on the left, or the one on the right is regular normal distribution, and one of them is CLT. Just take a look at them briefly, maybe just A and A, A in the first case here, and then A on the second case over here, and see if you can see how the questions are phrased differently so we can work, on, work out better at identifying what it means to be CLT. Just take a look at the first question of both choices and see if you can pinpoint the main difference. And of course, the idea behind CLT, as I mentioned back over here, is that we have to be talking about a sample. And so if you look at the first questions, on the left, we have a random sample of 40 people. So that's our big clue that we're talking about CLT. This is what makes it CLT. On the left, we're looking at a singular selection selecting only one person. 
And remember, by the definition of CLT, we need it to be more than one. And so if it's not more than one, we're not talking about CLT. We're talking about normal, normal distribution, just regular way of doing it. And so these on the left here are not considered CLT because you're selecting one person. If you're selecting one person, that means you're taking one person out of the population. And so you're actually experimenting on the population. While here, we're talking about 40 people. And we're trying to find out about their average score of that 40 people. So we're only talking about that close knit of that group. We're no longer talking about the population. And that's the main difference of how you identify a CLT. Are we sampling continuous data? If we are, to be able to be done by CLT, that sample needs to be 30 or bigger, or the population has to be normal. Because this says 40, that is clearly bigger than 30. And so this is a legitimate CLT question. And we'll see cases later on where they're not legitimate. OK, but how do we actually solve it, right? I've been blabbing on and on and on. Well, again, like before, like last week, it's the same technique. So when we want a probability, it's always going to be norm.dis because the dis gives you the probability and the norm because it's a normal distribution. And whenever it's less than, we can just plug in our values. Less than would be 2100. The mean they give us is 3420. The deviation they give us is 495. And always true. And yeah, you can put one there. I'm old. I don't use the number one. But if you like that, go for it. But that's all you would type in. And you'd hit go and you'd be done. And of course, less than is just how norm dot this is programmed. This program to find less than. So that means that when you have a question stating the opposite, aka more than, that just means you have to do one minus. So the more than means we have to do one minus. And so we're going to do one minus norm dot dis of the number in question. Given the mean of the problem. Given our standard deviation. Always, always true. And this is all we did last week. Just rehashing it just to remind us. And so now if I want between. We know that means you're going to do norm dot dis of the bigger measurement and norm dot dis of the smaller measurement and subtract them. And so norm dot dis, the bigger of those two values is 3650. Given that the standard, the mean is 3420, standard deviation, always true. And that's it. Oh, wait, minus, because there's two measurements, James. Norm dot dis of the smaller measurement, 2250, then given 3420, 495 from the very top there, always, always true. And you can type it as one giant sentence is how I like to do it. Or you can type each one separately and then subtract them. Doesn't matter. And let's see. And we've already answered these questions while well, I'm not bothered typing in because I did this exact questions on our last workshop. So feel free to check out my last boot camp to see us finish all this and actually type them up manually, including D and E. But we're here for CLT, so I'm going to jump over to the other side and actually get into the CLT questions. And if for some reason you missed my boot camp last week, just send me a private message and I'll give you a copy of the recording. And you can see those questions fully answered from last week. But we're here about CLT, so let's talk about this. First and foremost, notice this question on A is between. And it's the same technique, so we're still going to do norm.dis of our big measurement minus norm dot dis of our small. The only difference that we're going to see here is when I change what I would type in for the standard deviation. Sorry about that. I was trying to zoom in. There we go. OK, so let's actually do this one all the way through and so we can see what exactly would be different. So. We would first do norm dot dis. And normally it would just be 140 because that's the higher measurement. The mean is 100. The standard deviation is 15 and true. And then we would do norm dot dis, the smaller measurement, the mean, standard deviation, and true. And then you would hit enter and you'd be done. But 
we have a CLT situation where the sample size is 40, and we're talking about that sample size as the group we're focusing on. So we need to add in what we call a sampling modifier, aka standard error, to fix this. And all we're going to do is take our standard deviation, that 15 that I just typed, and behind it, I'm going to say divide by the square root of the sample size. The sample size was 40, so the square root of 40 and close parentheses. That's the only modification you do when you have a CLT. And so behind the 15 over here, divide it by the square root of 40 because they're both from the population or the sample of 40. And so what this does is it converts it from standard deviation. When you add that division, we call it standard error. So this whole thing, 15 over square root of 40, is the standard error. And you'll learn if you come to my workshops this week later on what it actually means to talk about standard error. For now, we're just going to focus on actually calculating it. But outside of adding that divide square root 40, nothing else is changing from what you've been doing. So we hit enter, and there's my probability. And of course, I can adjust the decimals to make sure there's no extra numbers going on, but clearly it looks like it's pretty much 0.5 all the way out. All right, the next one. Well, this says greater than. When we see greater than, we should always think one minus, right? For norm dot this. So let's set it up. It would be, make that font a little larger. One minus norm dot this, because I'm doing greater than. The measurement they're asking about is 110. The mean was given as 100. There it goes. And the standard deviation is 15, but because I sampled, I'm going to divide it by the square root of 40. And always, always true. Hit go, and you're done. It's the same old calculation. If you don't like the E notation, we know that's just scientific notation, but if you don't like it, you can go up to general, come to number, and then just round it to whatever level of precision you need from there. I personally don't mind the sign notation, but I know some people don't like seeing those E's. It freaks them out. So you can just change it. Just go to number and change it to whatever level of precision you need from there by rounding the decimals. Let's do some more. So first and foremost, decide, is this CLT or not? So the first thing you should be asking yourself is, did they sample two or more people? If they did, then we have to consider CLT. If they did not, we can do it the quote unquote normal way. And of course, if you're looking right here, A, 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 that means normal way. They did one symbol sele selection from the population so we can just do regular normal distribution techniques. And I know it's normal distribution because it's telling me. And also these measurements, these measurements are all continuous measurements. They're weights. We know that binomial and all that other stuff is discrete measurements. So here we go. We were looking at lower than. Lower just means norm dot dis. Higher than, that same thing as greater than. So we're going to do one minus norm dot dis. Between, no problem, norm dot dis of the big one minus norm dot dis of the small one. And we'll talk about the expected one in a second. And so let's run through it. Equals norm dot dis. The number in question, 165. That's our observation. The mean, 178.1. And the standard deviation, 40.7. Always, always true. And there we go. I want higher than 1 minus norm dot dis. Number in question is 255. The mean is given as 178.1. The standard deviation 40.7 and always, always true. Okay. Big minus small. Norm dot dis. The bigger number, I hope we all agree, is 200. Given 178.1. Standard deviation 40.7. Always true. Minus norm dot dis cannot spell. There we go. Smaller measurement given the mean, given the standard deviation, always true. 
no central limit modification necessary because there's no sample size greater than one. If you think about it, if you did divide by one, right, divide by the square root of one, dividing by one doesn't do anything, which is why we don't really consider this a CLT because your sample is only one person. Dividing by something besides one would do something, so we have to care about it then. Okay. Part D. Now we're talking about expected value. That's the key phrase here. And for normal distributions, expected value is n times p, right? We had two of them. We have the other one in the summation of x times p of x, but this one is only done on discrete distribution situations. Everyone else does n times p. And so we just need to decide what the n is. n is our total count of objects, in this case, 400. And so the p here is the probability of lower than 200. So the p is x is less than 200. Well, we know what lower means. That means less than. That means just norm dot dis. So let's make some notes. We need n, we need p, so that we can get expected value. n is given as 400. p will be the probability of less than, so norm dot dis. Less than is always just regular norm dot dis. 200. Given the mean of 178.1, standard deviation of 40.7, and always, always true. I have n, I have p, so I just need to times them together, n times p, to get my expected value. So if we find 400 men, 280 to 2 of them will have cholesterol lower than 200. That's what we would normally expect. Okay. Our e. We're still talking about, you know, the population. So we're not doing CLT yet. And we're talking about the highest 5%. And we know that this is a probability. So 5% is the highest is the right side here. And we're looking for a level, aka a measurement. Measurement will always be dot I and V. And since this is normal, we're going to do norm dot I and V. That matters because in the next unit, when you get to test three, you're going to have other distributions besides norm that have an I and V function. You're going to get to something called a T distribution. And so you have to worry about T dot I and V versus norm dot I and V. And you'll just have to know which one to pick based off of what you learn in the class. But anyways, we want to use norm dot inverse. And remember the way Excel's program, though, it only reads the left side of the data. 5% is in the higher group, so we need to figure out what's the lower end. Well, since it's all 100%, the lower end must be 95%. And so now we're ready. We can say norm.inverse of that 95%, because it's always the percentage on the left of the measurement, given the mean was 178.1 and the standard deviation is 40.7. And that's it. Hit go, and there's our measurement. That 245 is what separates the lower 95% from the upper 5%. So anybody higher than that mark is in the upper end, is um, in the top 5% of cholesterol, apparently. All right, let's go on to the next question. Maybe this one will be a CLT. Maybe it won't. We'll see. Read it and decide. Are we talking about CLT? Yes or no? And then we'll answer the questions. And if you remember my tips, whenever you get word problems, start at the question and read it backwards. It will give you the most information. You can skip all the unnecessary reading. As a person with a reading disability myself, I try to read as little as possible. But we can tell reading the first part of A here that we are definitely dealing with a sample. And that sample is greater than one, so we must consider CLT which is what they're asking you. They're asking you, can we use CLT? And because of the sample size greater than one here, we have to consider it. And of course, averages are continuous values, so it's possible. But let's think about it. For CLT, it has to meet one of two conditions. One, the population must be normal. Or two, the sample size is bigger or equal to 30. Well, we can already tell one fact. 26 is not bigger or equal to 30, so it fails that condition. 
What about the population, though? Well, it tells you right up here, the SAT population is normal. And so because the population is normal, yes, we can use CLT. And of course you would say because population is known to be normal. So the binomial conditions, remember you need all four things to be true. For CLT, we only need one or the other. We don't need both. If both are true, that's great, but you don't have to. All right, that's all they want to know for A. For B, they're giving us a sample size of 35 now, and they want us to find the mean and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sampled means. That's the fancy way of saying standard error. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sampled means is just a long way of saying what we often would just call it standard error. Same exact thing. They're just talking about, remember when I did this first thing, is I made a distribution of averages. I found a bunch of averages and then I graphed them to find out the shape of the averages. So this is a sampling distribution of my averages. And so it's a sampling distribution of the averages or the sampling distribution of the means. That's what they're saying in that part there of all those means. If you repeatedly sample and find all bunch of means, it would become a sampling distribution of means. So as I mentioned though, for CLT, because this is CLT, what do we assume about the mean? The mean will always be the population mean, which tells, told us to it right here, 540. For CLT, the mean will always be the population mean. Because I'm talking about an average, we usually denote it as X with a bar. That refers to the fact that I'm talking about a sampled average. As a population average, we use that U looking thing. For sample average, we use X bar. And now we want to talk about the sampling, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means. I won't ever say that again. I'll say standard error because it's just easier. And we can denote that as SE. Some people just use S. I like SE because later on you're going to have a standard deviation of the samples, which is slightly different, and you're going to use that S again. So I personally use SE for a standard error. And remember that one has to always be the standard deviation. So 115. But like in the last question, we're going to divide it by the square root of how big the sample is. In this case, the sample is 35. And so if I use distribution notation, I would say this is normally distributed. That should be an N, not an M. It's normally distributed. And so it's described normally with a mean of 540 and a standard error of 115 over root 35. All three of these notations are absolutely fine. The bottom one is just my preferred way of writing. It. But you can do any of those you like. OK, enough of that. Let's actually move on to the last question now. It says between. We're finding a probability between. So that, of course, means norm dot dis of the big measurement. Minus norm dot dis. Of the small measurement. It should be a little this there. And of course, the only difference is when we get to the standard deviation step, we're going to utilize standard error instead. That's the only difference we're talking about CLT, is that we have to modify for the fact that we're talking about a group and no longer talking about the population. So norm dot this, the bigger measurement was 575. The mean we're assuming to be the population mean. And now our deviation is 115 divided by the square root of our sample size. Always true. So again, the only thing I modified was added in the sample size um, factor. Now let's do the other one. Norm dot this 550 given 540 is the mean and our standard error modification 115 divided by the square root of our sample size. Always true. And so just remember, if you're dealing with a sample greater than one, 
and it meets the CLT conditions of a population that's normal or a sample size greater than 30, we can utilize this function. And so just to be overly clear with you, this the part A back here, we could have been asked to do it on the 26 as well. I know it's not bigger than 30, but since the population is normal, we can still use norm.dist on it. And you'll see a question on that later on. Just want to remind us that if it meets either condition, we can do that calculation. Is this a CLT question? Remember to be CLT has to be continuous and it has to have a sample size greater than one. And then it has to meet the two conditions of the actual sample sizes, you know, bigger than 30 or the population is normal. Well, this is definitely bigger than 30. But is the data continuous? And the answer is no. We're talking about finding whole numbers of people, 80 people that are right handed or 87 less than 87 that are right-handed. These are all discrete questions. Furthermore, another red flag is I'm not being told a mean or standard deviation or something to that effect. Now, yes, you could go and calculate a mean because binomials, this is binomial, as we learned from binomial back in the day, but this is binomial, so we could have calculated a mean and we could calculate a standard deviation, but we have not learned how to convert that kind of standard deviation into standard error. And you'll not learn that technique until um, test three material. And so, yes, there is a way to convert binomials into normals. But for now, we don't know that technique. And so for now, if it's binomial, treat it binomially and don't try to convert the CLT. And since we're talking about whole number of people, we're going to use our binome.dist.range stuff. And since we've done that before, I'm going to go through it a little fast. We want exactly 80 people, so binome.dist.range. The total trials, the sample size, the probability is given. And since this part will never change, I'm gonna highlight and copy it. So I can just kind of keep repeating that part. And let's keep it going now. Exactly 80 means I just type 80 and I stop. I want only 80. Hit enter, and boom, I'm done. And yes, you can always round it as you need to. Okay, less than 87, so I'm going to go as low as 0 because the less than 87 and up to 86 because 87 is not less than 87. And so there we go, as low as 0 and up to 86. Okay, at least 80. That means 80 or more, right? So 80 and up to the maximum, which is 115, because it's only 115 people. Okay. At most, 90. Oh, we can do that. That means don't go past 90. So what's the lowest you can go? Zero. What's the most you can have? Obviously, 90. More than 85. Okay, got this. So more than 85. What's the smallest number that's more than 85? How about 86? What's the most that's more than 85? 115. And that's it. Notice that most of the time you just got to identify what kind of question it is and then utilize the function. Here the minimum is told is 82 and don't go past no more than 92. So it's literally telling you two bounds. But that was the refresher on binomial. We've done this before. Let's keep it moving. All right, think on this question. Is it normal and is it CLT? Well, no. We can tell up top here, turn my pin back on, that this is very, very much discrete. And we're not talking about a bunch of averages, so we're not converting it to a normal. And so this is literally a discrete distribution table. So we have to go back to the way back and remember how we did it back in the day. Just reminding us because we know we got a test coming up. And so I'm reviewing some of these older formulas and stuff. 
So first thing we're going to do is verify that the probability is valid. That has three steps. First, every probability must be greater or equal to zero. Second, every probability must be less than or equal to one. And third, the sum of the probabilities must be exactly one. And so let's take a look on the right. They're all bigger than zero, check. They're all less than or equal to one, check. And does the sum add up to one? Well, let's highlight them. Highlight our four probabilities here and take a quick peek down below. And yes, the sum in fact is one. So this is a valid probability distribution and met all three requirements. Sometimes you, you forget and you only check this bottom requirement. Be very careful. You can have probability distribution that meets that requirement but fails to one of the first two. So just keep that in mind. OK. Now let's go ahead and go with it. So we're looking for the mean and the variance and all that fun stuff. And since we're doing a discrete distribution table, the mean is the same thing as expected value. And that's going to be the summation of x times p of x. So we're going to need x times p of x. So the first row here was x. The second row was p. We're given that in the problem. And so we're going to do x times p. And we're just going to take that calculation all the way to the right. That's x times p of x. And so the expected value, aka the mean, will just be its summation. We're just going to add up those four calculations. And there's my expected value. Now we need to do the long and horrible calculation of the variance and standard deviation. And as I mentioned before, in terms of like amount of time on a test, that's going to be the longest calculation on this test. And that's because the formula has a bunch of steps, not hard calculations, there's a lot of them. But just to remind us, the standard deviation formula is the square root of x minus the average squared times p of x. And then we're going to add all that up. And so the part here in yellow, that part there in the middle, that's the variance. Because the square root of the variance will always be the standard deviation. And they want both things identified. So we'll just make sure we have all that. So the first step we're going to do is x minus the average. We often call it mu. Then we're going to square that calculation. And then we're going to take that calculation I just talked about squared and times it by p of x. Then we're ready for the variance and finally the standard deviation. So we can see that there's going to be essentially one, two, three, four, five steps to get the calculation. And so we want the x value up top to minus the average. And it's often tempting to type 0.6, but you don't always know that that number is a nice number. It could be 0.5999824 or whatever. And so you're generally recommended to cell reference. But if I don't lock this cell and I start dragging to the right, it's not going to work. It's going to give me obviously the wrong calculations. And so since I want this calculation up here, that x values to vary, but I don't want the average score to ever vary, you need to lock it. And the way you lock this R5 square is to put a dollar sign in front and behind the R. That tells it to never change that calculation, but change the other one. So it's going to change the 0 to a 1, to a 2, to a 3, but it won't change that 0 0.6 calculation. Now I can take it all the way to the right. Now, it is true if the mean here is a nice number. I didn't look. But if it's a nice number, you see how it's actually 0.5999? I could have typed 0.5999 instead of locking the cell. But you won't always know or won't always be an easy number to work with, in which case knowing how to lock your cell will make it a lot easier for you. Otherwise, you might end up with a rounding error. So just take it how you want it. But I really recommend that you learn how to cell lock like I just did. Now that we have that calculation, I'm just going to shrink those decimals back down a little bit. Bring it back over. There we go. All I want to do is square my previous calculation. And maybe make myself a little bigger so it can quit yelling at me about not fitting. There we go. And now I got it squared. I can times it by the P of X. I can do these two in one step. I can just drag the dot 
and I'll do both calculations all at once if I wanted to. And if the, if the hashtags bother you, you can expand them out to where they can show you them. You don't actually need those numbers for anything. So in terms of what they actually say is a material, we really only needed that last row. But I just expanded out anyways. And so the variance is the summation of our last row of calculations. You just sum them all up. That's the variance. And so our standard deviation is your square root of variance. And there we go. And so I now have the variance and the standard deviation done. And let's see, so that would be D. And so expected value, because we know expected value is the mean, we actually already did that calculation. They try to trick us and separate B, which is mean, and E, which is expected value. It's the same thing. Then they want us to construct a probability histogram. That's just a graph of the probabilities. So we're just going to come over here, highlight our four probabilities, insert, bar graph, pick the first one, quick layout number eight to get rid of the gaps, and there is our probability histogram. Very much heavily right skewed because the right side's much lower than the left side, so this is a right skewed distribution. If I want to interpret that results then, According to the story, three males are linked to having a disorder. The random variable shows the likelihood of their kids inheriting the disorder. And so if we have three males, we're looking at, you know, because zero and one are actually the first two values here, the zero and one. Zero to one of them would actually pass on the genetic disorder to their children, right? Because the number of children that would have it. Actually, the random variable is the number of children that would inherit it. So my apologies. So zero or one children would inherit the disorder. Very unlikely three or two would. That's all, we're just looking for the bars and talking to the peaks, right? Okay, let's keep it moving. That's all review. Read the question and decide if this is CLT or not. And if it is CLT, let's talk about how we're gonna solve it. I'll give you a second to think about this one. Okay, so reading down halfway through, we'll see a very important fact that we have a sample. So we're talking about something that could potentially be CLT because we have a sample going on. And we're talking about averages. That's continuous data. So we have to consider CLT. When you have continuous data with a sample, you must consider CLT. Okay. In order to do CLT, one, population must be normal. Or two, the sample size is greater or equal to 30. Well, I don't even care what the population is because the sample size is 43. So we can totally do CLT. And now we're looking for a probability that it's 134 or less. So less, of course, means just norm dot dis, right? So we're gonna say, Norm dot this. The amount in question is 134. The mean up top there is 135.2. Standard deviation is 8.1. But because we got a sample, we're going to divide it by the square root of the sample size. It's the only thing that we modify when we have a sample. And then always true. And that's all we do. When it's less than, we just do norm dot dis. If it was more than, I would do one minus norm dot dis. Between norm dot dis minus norm dot small. So norm dot dis big minus norm dot dis small. Okay. Part two is actually giving away a big hint. They're telling us that it's not possible. And you got to figure out why it's not possible. Well, we would just have to talk to the fact that it doesn't meet either condition. We can see the sample size is 23. 23 is definitely less than 30. So that's a red flag. And if we read back at the very, very top, you'll see it never says, it never claims that the normal, the population is normal. It doesn't tell us that. And you cannot assume just because you're dealing with decimals that it has to be normal. There's a whole other distribution out there called T 
that you'll learn about in the next unit for test three that handles situations that are not always normal. And so we can't assume that's normal unless it tells it to us. So in this case, it isn't, is not CLT because sample size is too small and we don't know if population is normal. That should be a F, if population is normal. So if it said the population was normal, it wouldn't matter how big the sample size was. You can do the work. If the sample size was bigger than 30, it wouldn't matter the population was normal. We can do the work. So we could do the calculation for the 43, even though we didn't know the population because that's bigger than 30. And remember, when I drug this down to about 30, it started becoming normal. And so we treat it that way. So that's why we could answer the first question just fine, but we couldn't do the second one. Last question of the day. So I just want our shorter ones because CLT is pretty much what you've been doing just with that one extra modification. Divide by the square root of the sample size. OK. So looking at A. We can see there's no mention of sample, no sample. So that means we're going to do the regular normal distribution technique. It's not CLT. And we're looking for typing speed less than 25. So we're looking for the probability that it's going to be less than 25. We're given the fact that the population is normal. And we have a mean of 30.6 and a standard deviation of 14.1. So since we're talking about it being normal, we're going to assume it's continuous and we're going to go ahead and start calculating. So if it's less than, we know it's just regular norm.dis. Let me make my font visible to the world. There we go. So regular norm.dis, less than 25, given the mean was 30.6, standard deviation 14.1, always, always true. And there we go. OK, next question. Big keyword here, more than. Because we see more than, we now know to do 1 minus norm dot this. OK, 1 minus norm dot this. It's looking at 45, given the mean was 30.6. Standard deviation is 14.1 and true. And there we go. One minor thing to correct about my previous answer is it did trick me up a little bit. It says percent, and I didn't write a percent. So I would have lost, you know, two easy points. I'm going to go back to it, click on home, and just change it to a percent, and maybe a couple of decimal places. So now I have a percentage. Don't lose the easy points. Read it carefully. I obviously did not. For the second question, of course, we're talking about a single person. That's not a big enough sample. We need at least two to consider CLT. So we do it the normal way. And that's just one minus norm dot dis, which is what we did. OK. Part C. We're now looking for a cutoff. That means we're looking for a measure. Whenever you want to measure, it's always dot I and V. We see that it says top 15%, but we need the percentage on the left, which is 85%. If you weren't sure, you can do 100 minus 15 and see that it's 85. But norm.inverse, 85%, given the mean was 30.6, the deviation is 14.1, no need for true for this function, and there we go. Anybody bigger than that is in the upper 15%. Anybody lower than that is in the lower 15%. Okay. Part D. 
Part D, notice it says that we randomly select 36 individuals. Can we use the central limit theorem? And the answer is yes. In fact, we, got, we have double good news on this one. The sample size is greater than 30. Check. And if you recall the very beginning, the population is told to be normal. So in this case, they double dipped and told you two facts. We only needed one. We know the population is normal. And they give us a big enough sample size. So if you only actually need one of those cases to be true, but in this case, they're both true. And so if I want to describe what's happening, can we use it? You would say yes, because the, the sample size is greater than 30 and the population is known to be normal. So absolutely can't, you can do that. And they're asking you, what would be the mean of our sampled mean? What's the average of the averages? Well, we know that always approximates the population average. And our population average is 30.6. It will never change. And so we would just say 30.6. Nothing fancy there. But our standard deviation of the sampled means, aka standard error, does change. That will be our standard deviation divided by the square root of how big the sample was. So 14.1 divided by the square root of 36. In Excel terms, you would say equals 14.1 divided by SQRT 36. Either way. Okay. Part G. We are dealing with a random sample. The sample size is big enough. We already confirmed that earlier. And we're trying to find the probability that it's 26 or less, so that it's less than or equal to 26.4. And we know for normals, the equality here doesn't actually matter. And so we're going to worry about our calculation. And notice they're trying to trick you. They're saying, well, the sample mean was 26.4. But we know that when we use our norm.dis function, and they ask for that mean calculation, we're always going to use the population mean. So don't fall for that trap. We're not going to use a sampled mean for the mean box, <laughs> for the average score. It will always be the population mean. Don't fall for that little trick there of theirs. So we're going to say, because it's less than just regular norm.dis, the measurement in question is 26.4. The population mean was 30.6. And now for standard deviation, because we sampled, we're going to use this 14.1 divided by the square root of the sample size. And then always true. So remember, the only thing I'm adding on from what we've been doing is this divide by square root part. Otherwise, it'd be the same kind of calculation we did last week. There we go. That's the probability that if you get 36 adults and you take their average, that the average typing time would be 26.4 or less. And now we're being asked, is that probability, is the one that we just calculated, significantly slow? Well, remember how we define significance. The probability that an extreme is less than 0 0.05. In this case, our extreme is this left side over here, which we just calculated. So this 26.4, less than 26.4. And so was our calculation less than 0 0.05? Absolutely. Yes. It is significantly, since we're talking about time, um, slow. We would not expect people to only type 26 words in a minute. That's what it's essentially telling us, or at least an average from a group of people. So if you grab 36 adults and you tell them to type as fast as they can for a minute, you would not expect that average of that group to be 26 words per minute. 
you would expect, you know, some people in that group to be high enough to pull the average up above 26.4. In fact, up closer to that mean of um, 30.6. That's the more kind of normal mead mode, sorry, mode value that we would expect. And so in this case, you would say something to the effect of, yes, it's significantly slow for a sentence. The probability of typing 26.4 words per minute or less is only 0 0.04, which is statistically very low. Essentially, anything less than 0 0.05 is considered very low, which just means it's a very improbable or unlikely event. And so if you have a group of people that type that slow, you have the authority to officially call them slow typers because that group happening is just so freaking different from the rest of the group that there's something unusual. In this case, it's their typing speed it makes them unusually slow. So yeah, statistically, we can actually use that phrase that you're a type slow typer. Not just based off of pure kind of judgment, but actually some kind of mathematical precision. That's everything in a nutshell, everybody. Essentially, CLT is the same thing you've been doing with normal distribution stuff. You're just adding in that modifier. You're just adding in this division by the square root of the sample size. And so if the sample is greater than one, and we're talking about continuous data, and we're talking about either the population is normal and the overall sample selection is 30 or bigger, then we can do CLT on it. If one of those conditions aren't met, you can't. Well, that's CLT in a nutshell. If you want to get at more deeper into what standard error is, come out to one of my um, workshops this week. I got two in person, two hours a pop, and then I have three one-hour sessions online, breaking everything up over three different nights. You got to register for the online ones. Um, otherwise, for the in-person ones, you just got to show up. Same content, whether it's in-person or online. Well, that's everything. I will post in the chat a, a post survey. I hope you have a great day. And of course, when this is all done, you'll find the video um, populated into the chat where we saw Grace say done.